Unit 8, Structure and Function of State Government. Chapter 23, State and Local Government. <clears throat> Here's a look at our chapter objectives. For Section 1, <clears throat> we look at state constitutions. We'll explain the importance and functions of state constitutions. Section 2, we'll look at the three branches. We'll discuss the organization and functions of the three branches of state governments. Uh, section 3, State Government Policy. We will analyze ways in which state governments write and enforce public policy. And for Section 4, Financing State Government, we'll identify and evaluate the various sources of state revenue. Section 1, State Constitutions. The importance of constitutions. State constitutions create the structure of state governments. State constitutions establish local governments such as counties, townships, municipalities, special districts, parishes, and boroughs. State constitutions regulate how state and local governments can raise and spend money. State constitutions establish independent state agencies, boards, and commissions. <clears throat> Constitutional characteristics. All state constitutions have a Bill of Rights with most of the protections as in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution of the United States. And many states also guarantee other rights. Many state constitutions have become long documents as a result of additions made over the years. Long state constitutions are filled with detailed, specific provisions, often reflecting special interest politics. Amendments and changes. Uh, some state constitutions have a great number of amendments. Constitutions of the 50 states provide four different methods of proposing amendments. The most common method of proposing amendments is by the state legislatures. 18 states also allow the people to propose amendments by popular initiative. And some states allow a state constitutional convention to propose amendments. And some states use a constitutional commission to propose amendments. All states, except for Delaware, require ratification of amendments by popular vote. Most require a simple majority vote. When voters, rather than the legislature, vote on an issue, it is called a referendum. Criticism and reform. Over the years, critics have charged that state constitutions are too long and filled with needless detail. In order to replace existing state constitutions, most states require a constitutional convention. In most states, the legislature proposes the convention, which the voters must approve, and then voters in a new election choose delegates to write a new document or propose changes to the existing constitution. During the 18, or 1980s, more state judges began to interpret state constitutions independently of the Constitution of the United States. Section 2, the three branches. The legislative branch. The legislature passes laws. Members of, the state, uh, of state legislatures are elected from legislative districts. Qualifications for members are outlined in state constitutions. Many state legislators work part-time in other fields. Most state legislatures are bicameral, hold annual sessions, and conduct business through committees. <clears throat> Many bills originate in the executive branch of the state, the state government. A bill begins in either house of the state legislature and is debated and voted on and then the governor either vetoes or signs past bills. The executive branch. The governor heads the executive branch of the state government. State constitutions are outlined, or I'm sorry, state constitutions outline qualifications of the governor. A governor generally must be nominated by a major political party and win the general election. Most governors serve four-year terms. In 18 states, governors and other officials can be removed from office by a recall, which is a special election uh, 
designed to remove them from office. One that we have used here in California when we recalled former Governor Gray Davis, and that's when Arnold Schwarzenegger first became the California governor. Uh, the governor proposes and signs laws, represents the state to foreign businesses, and, uh, is his or her party's state leader, and works to obtain federal grants. Most governors prepare the state budget and are commander-in-chief of the state National Guard. Since 1965, most states have given governors greater executive power. Governors supervise the executive branch of the state government. They propose legislation, veto bills, call special sessions of the state legislature, and have limited power over the state court system. Most states elect other members of the executive branch. <clears throat> The judicial branch. State courts interpret and apply state and local laws to civil and criminal cases. The justice court performs marriages and handles minor civil and criminal cases. Municipal courts, police courts, and magistrate courts handle cases of petty crime or property disputes. Other minor courts include small claims court, juvenile court, domestic relations court, traffic court, and probate court. State general trial courts hear cases involving serious crimes. State appeals courts review cases of lower courts. And a state supreme court is the final court of appeal, for at least for issues relating to state law. Judges may be removed from office. <clears throat> Section 3, state government policy. State regulation of business. Business corporations must have a charter issued by a state government. Federal and state governments regulate uh, giant corporations. States have laws to protect consumers from unfair practices and to protect the health and the safety of workers. State governments provide workers' compensation. Workers in all states have the right to belong to labor unions. State governments try to attract new business and industry. States' concerns for economic growth sometimes clash with public concern for the environment. In 1989, Congress strengthened the state's power to protect the environment. State governments have begun to monitor the environmental impact of major projects. Protecting life and liberty. State and local governments are responsible for protecting life and property and for establishing a criminal code and a system of punishment. State police forces have investi investigative powers in many states, but they have broad responsibilities in a few states. State courts handle the majority of all criminal cases in the United States. In strained state justice systems, many states are giving judges more sentencing options. Providing for education, health, and welfare. State governments provide about 45% of revenues for local public schools. State spending for education generally has increased. The state licenses doctors and dentists, regulates the sale of medicines, and requires vaccinations for school children. State agencies provide programs of public welfare, health and human services, with federal assistance, states help people with special needs. With Medicaid assistance, states help low-income people pay medical bills. Section 4, Financing State Government. <clears throat> tax Revenue. Individual state constitutions limit state taxing powers, as does the Constitution of the United States. <clears throat> Today, most state governments have some type of sales tax, which accounts for about half of the total tax revenue of state governments. Most states now also have individual income taxes and corporate income taxes, which account for more than 30% of all state tax revenues. Now, of course, there are some states that don't have sales tax, and there are some states that don't have income tax. Uh, here in California, we have both. 
States require license fees for various businesses and professions. Uh, for example, uh, to be a teacher, I have to have a teaching credential. And that credential is, there is a state licensing fee, basically, that I pay to renew my credential every five years. Um, there also are many other licenses out there. Uh, if you wanted to be an insurance agent, there are different, depending on what type of insurance you're selling, you have to be licensed by the state. First, you have to meet all the requirements of the license, including passing an examination, taking classes, uh, but then you also have to maintain that license by taking additional classes and paying whatever fees the state requires. And, you know, there are state contractors licenses. And, you know, so many different industries have some form of a state license that they have to pay. Uh, as well as they have license fees for operating motor vehicles. So, you know, if you own a car, you have a state license fee, fee that is paid to the Department of Motor Vehicles when you register your car. Your car registration is due every year. Uh, as a part of that, you pay a fee to cover your license. Uh, states impose taxes for removing natural resources from state land or water. <clears throat> Many states also have less well-known taxes, such as state property tax, estate taxes, and inheritance taxes. <clears throat> Other sources of revenue. Since taxes finance only a part of state government expenses, states turn to borrowing, lotteries, and the federal government. States borrow money by selling bonds to pay for large long-term expenditures, such as highway construction. Nearly three-fourths of the states run public lotteries to raise revenue. Lotteries became the fastest-growing source of state revenues in the 1980s. The federal government provides about 20% of all state revenues, much in the form of grants and aid, and stipulates how the grants may be used. Categorical formula grants go to states on different basis, depending on the state's wealth. During the 1980s and 1990s, the federal government's share of state and local government revenues declined, but unfunded, federally mandated programs increased until Congress passed the Unfunded Mandate Reform Act to curb unfunded mandates in 1995. Now, when we're talking about a mandate, we're talking about something that the federal government requires but they used to have to, you know, a lot of times when they create a mandate, they provide funding for it, but then they would quit funding it and still require it uh, until this unfunded mandate reform act made, you know, change that so that they don't have to uh, provide it when the funds are not provided. Chapter 24, Structure and Function of Local Government. Section 1, we'll look at the structure of local government. Section 2, serving localities. And Section 3, the challenges of urban growth. Our chapter objectives for Section 1, describe and compare various forms of local government. For Section 2, explain how local governments provide a range of services to residents of the community. And Section 3, identify problems that metropolitan areas face and potential solutions. Section 1, the structure of local government. Okay, local governments have no legal independence. Each is dependent on its state government. State constitutions set forth the powers and the duties of local governments. The four basic types of local government are the county, the township, the municipality, and the special district. The county is normally the largest territorial and political subdivision of the state. Counties vary in number, size, population, power, and influence. In most metropolitan areas, the county government has been growing more powerful. In most counties, a county board has both executive and legislative powers. Board officials are usually elected by the voters. Townships exist in less, less than half of the states 
and their powers and duties vary from state to state. In New England, select men now make some of the decisions citizens once made in the, in the direct democracy of a town meeting. The municipality is an urban unit of government that has legal rights granted to it by the state. The special district is a unit of local government that deals with a special function, such as education or transportation. So, for example, uh, our school district is an example of a special district. It is really a government institution. Uh, it is a public school. So, the Oakdale Joint Unified School District is a special district that is set up to serve the educational need of K-12 students in the area of Oakdale and the surrounding communities. Um, so, uh, you know, that's you know one example of a special district. Some states also have a separate tribal government that serves its Native American population. Forms of municipal government. A municipal government may be formed when the people in a community ask the state legislature to permit their community to incorporate. Urban areas in the United States use one of three basic forms of government. The mayor council, the commission, or the council manager. In the most widely used form of municipal government, the mayor-council form, executive power belongs to an elected mayor and the legislative power to an elected council. There are two types of mayor-council government, the strong mayor system and the weak mayor system. The commission form of municipal government combines executive and legislative powers in an elected commission that passes laws and makes policy decisions. Under the council manager form of government, the executive and legislative powers are separated. The council acts as the legislative body and makes the policy of the municipality. And a manager carries out the council's policies and serves as the chief administrator. Serving localities, section two. Local government services. Local school districts provide most of the money and make most of the decisions regarding the operation of public schools. Local governments use zoning to regulate the way land and buildings are used. Police and fire protection make up a large part of the local budget. Local governments make vital decisions regarding road maintenance, water service, and sewage disposal and treatment. Many local governments offer important services to citizens who have special needs and provide recreation and cultural programs for their residents. Metropolitan communities. Urban communities differ greatly in size. Cities are densely populated areas with residential, commercial, and industrial sections. Cities in the southern and western United States are the fastest growing. In the nation's early years, most Americans lived in small towns. After the 1860s, cities grew faster than towns and villages. Between 1950 and 1990, suburbs or small towns and rural areas again attracted many Americans. <clears throat> Special districts. Local governments frequently establish special districts to solve problems. The school district is governed by the school board. Now, of course, if you, for example, once again, if we look at our local school system, the Oakdale Joint Unified School District is run by the, the school board. And the school board uh, are individuals that are elected. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we have, uh, I believe, most of the p positions on the school board are at large, which means that uh, basically anybody kind of within the, the Oakdale district could, you know, any adult could run for uh, one of those school board positions. But then there's also, I, I believe, one area that is Valley Home that is a separate 
district. It's a district unto itself. Um, where only Valley Home residents can run, but of course Valley Home students, uh, while they do attend Valley Home Elementary, or many of them, them do, uh, for junior high and high school they come to Oakdale and, and are part of this district. Um, <clears throat> so the school board ultimately makes those decisions, and ultimately it is the school board who makes hiring decisions as far as uh, deciding who our superintendent would be. And so the superintendent ultimately answers to the school board. The superintendent is the highest person in our school district. Uh, underneath the superintendent are assistant superintendents. And then um, sometimes there are some other site or some other, I'm sorry, district level uh, administrators. And then you get down to your site level administrators, which is your uh, principals and sometimes vice principals at different sites. And then you have, of course, you have your classified staff, uh, which includes you know, secretaries, maintenance workers, custodians, uh, the transportation department, groundskeepers, um, you know, numerous positions paraprofessionals, um, and then you also have your certificated, which would be teachers and counselors. And the principal ultimately kind of oversees the school district, um, or oversees the, I won't say the school district, oversees the school, the site administrator. Ultimately, the principal is kind of the highest at the school, or at the site level, but from there it goes up. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the school board that is primarily responsible, and they are elected. So uh, that's always something that is a factor. They can always be either removed from office uh, you know, by not being reelected during election time, or of course, um, I mean, you know, obviously they could be reelected. Uh, so they're held accountable to the voters. So they're, you know, they're not hired in a job per se, but they're voted into office, but ultimately they're the ultimate authority. Now, looking at regional arrangements. In the 1990s, local governments joined to develop new approaches for handling regional problems. Cooperative efforts have solved land use, water supply, waste management, and law enforcement problems. Financing local government. Local governments finance services by levying taxes such as property taxes, that's one of the major source of revenues for local governments. Um, most Americans view property taxes as unfair. They place a heavier burden on those with low incomes and may result in unequal public services. Revenue sources for local governments include lo local income taxes, sales taxes, fines and fees, government-owned businesses, bonds, and state grants. Um, so as we look at some of these, you know, local income taxes, um, you know, around here we don't see too many local governments that really levy an income tax. There is property taxes, but many communities may have a local sales tax. So if you take, you know, our state sales tax, there may be an additional uh, tax that is local. Um, now another type of tax that sometimes is used, especially in areas that may have a lot of, uh, a lot of tourists. They might use uh, special local taxes, such as a room tax. Um, that, you know, certain things where they tend to tax services that are not often used by members of the community, but are used by people that visit the community. So, you know, oftentimes, if you actually look at the taxes you may, you may spend when you stay in a hotel somewhere, uh, the taxes are more than just the regular sales tax rate because you're paying local taxes. Um, and oftentimes, like I said, those can be fairly high because, uh, you know, ultimately the people that pay it aren't the people that live in the community that approved it, uh, generally speaking. Fines and fees, that's another way that they're going to collect money. And, you know, by fining people for violations of certain things. 
even tickets uh, can can go into the local re revenue coffers. In other words, if you're if you get a ticket for something and have a fine to pay relating to that, um, and as so we talk about fees, there are many different fees. A business license, for example, if you want to start a business and you obtain a business license, you may have uh, a, a license fee that you're going to pay in your community, and uh, there's also a good possibility that you may have additional taxes to pay. For example, uh, I'm not sure what the what the situation is here in Oakdale, but um, you know when I used to live in Modesto and had a business, I paid a mill tax, which was uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty small tax overall, but quarterly, meaning every three months I had to pay a a mill tax based on my receipts for that three month period. So. Um, you know that oftentimes is another way that local communities can generate income. <clears throat> now, section three, looking at challenges of urban growth, population and housing. Municipal governments attempt to manage land use to encourage orderly growth. This is difficult since population shifts have caused inner cities to decline. Uh, mayors of large cities in decline appealed to the federal government for help in the 1950s and 1960s. The federal government provided massive spending to help cities address their housing problems. The results were not encouraging. Urban renewal programs added new low-rent public housing, but slowed construction of other types of housing. For many years, suburbs and smaller communities excluded African Americans and other minorities. And apartment owners discriminated against the elderly, the poor, and families with children. Many large cities responded to the housing shortage by renovating older housing units. The federal government also provided loans to local housing authorities through public housing programs. Social problems. Large cities face serious social problems. Unemployment and housing shortages contribute to the problem of homeless people. The federal government, through the media, has publicized drug abuse and spent huge amounts for drug treatment and prevention programs. Meeting future challenges. Large cities also have many problems that add to their financial burdens. The infrastructure of older large cities shows severe signs of wear and needs repair. Local governments encourage the public to use mass transit to reduce traffic and air pollution. Cities struggle to solve their financial problems and recently have focused on stimulating greater economic development. Beginning in the 1980s, middle-income suburbanites and recent immigrants moved into the cities, often restoring old houses and other buildings. While this improved many neighborhoods, it also displaced residents. In the 1980s, the nation's attention seemed to be shifting from city problems to suburban opportunities. Many people feel that metropolitan government must be reorganized to serve a larger region and to reduce government waste and duplication of services. And that is kind of an area where you can have government waste uh, if services are duplicated, um, meaning you have you know, basically two different groups that ultimately are responsible for providing the same thing to the same area. Um, or something else that happens in terms of school districts. Uh, particularly as we, we looked at the at the budget crunch that's happened with the economic downturn in 2008 and all the problems here uh, that face the state of California, some people have suggested the possibility of combining school districts. Uh, for example, if you look at the city of Modesto, the city of Modesto has one public high school district, and that is the Modesto City Schools which also oversees many junior highs and elementary schools. But there are multiple other districts that have uh, both junior high and elementary schools within their districts. For example, Sylvan 
as uh, I think le at least two junior high slash middle schools and uh, a handful of elementaries. And they're located in Modesto, but they are a separate school district. Um, you've got the Stanislaus Union District that is located in Modesto. Um, you, you know, and there's, off the top of my head, I can't think of the others, but there are others. Uh, you know, several little, little tiny, small districts that are separate from the Modesto City Schools. Well, ultimately, each one of these school districts will have a superintendent. Some of them will have assistant superintendents. So, if they were able to condense all of those and put those all into one school district, let's say they all, all those little smaller districts merged with the Modesto City Schools, then you could, in theory, eliminate some of the administrative positions because you would not need all of those superintendents. You would have one. Uh, you may add a few additional positions, administrative positions at the district level for Modesto City Schools to help ease the burden from the additional schools that are at being added on, but you would not have um, you know, all of these different positions that they might have otherwise. So that would be a way that they could save money, and many critics feel that that type of, of restructuring of metropolitan government would allow things to be more efficient and reduce government waste. 